Hello and welcome back. OK, so I want some control to add to my system. Now, I've done a bunch of videos before on the NES controller. I built a circuit to interface to one. I even built my own NES controller. So I've been thinking about the kind of games I'd like to develop for my system. And the NES doesn't quite have enough buttons for all of my needs. So an obvious choice would be to upgrade to the SNES controller. It's got two extra thumb buttons and the extra shoulder buttons, which actually are going to be very handy. So what I'd like to do is look at the circuit differences necessary to go from a NES controller to a SNES controller, and then go on and interface that into the main CPU build. Let's have a look at that. Here's my original NES interfacing circuit. I use a 555 timer as the clock source there, which gave me a bit of flexibility on the, the speed. But here's my SNES controller. Now the connector's different, and it's got an extra four inputs. So 8-bit shift register is not going to cut it. Now firstly, I need to do a similar thing to this in order to get access to those wires. So I've made this cable up. Now I did record the process of doing that, even though it's fairly straightforward, but that's a little video on the Extras channel if you want to see it. Fresh new breadboard. Okay, so we believe the SNES controller works in pretty much the same way as the NES controller, but it's got more bits to transmit. So we know there's a clock line we need to drive, and instead of using the 555 timer, I think it would be an idea to use one of the pre-existing clocks that already exists in the build. Now we've got the 1.843 megahertz clock that is used for both the UART and the sound system. So I'm going to make use of that because not having an extra clock in the build is probably going to make our lives a bit easier. What I would say though is the 1.8 megahertz is probably faster than we want, especially when we take into account we've got a whole wire coming off it. So I'm going to divide that down just by putting an extra counter in. Because this crystal's not going to be on the on the circuit board with it. So if to create our clock signal we just put a single counter in that's going to effectively become a, a clock divider, then that's actually a pretty reasonable compromise. I'm going to use the 19 freeze. That's what I used last time. And I do have a whole bunch of these still lying around. VCC and ground are easy. That countdown will pull that up. Load will pull up because it's active low. And then clear will pull down because it's active high. All right, so then if we take the clock signal there direct from our crystal, and then we actually treat the high bit of that as our clock line, we'll have a nicely divided signal. On the original NES circuit, we needed to generate the strobe signal for copying the data from the buttons into the shift register internal to the controller. We needed to do that once in every eight cycles. But here, I'm guessing we need to do it in every 12 cycles, or actually 16 would work because we've got shift registers at each end and we're just going to be pulling in a few extra zeros. So we need a counter, but rather than clocking for eight times, we need to create our latch signal one in every 16 cycles, which is actually going to be easier because we can use the carry mechanic from one of the counter chips. I can never seem to plan these circuits and nothing goes in at an angle. Load lines high again, clear is low, count down we pull high, and this time the count up we're going to take from that high bit of the output. Right, so we should be seeing a pulse every 16 cycles on the carry. Let's have a look at that on the scope and see what we're getting. Right, let's take a look at the clock once we've been through the divider. Okay, 115 kilohertz. That still seems really fast, but um, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work. We can always divide it down further if we have problems. Now let's have a look at that carry line. The carry line's on the yellow trace with the trigger, and then the clock's on the purple trace. 
Okay, so this latch signal is slightly problematic because we need to invert it. It needs to be a high going signal. So let's get an inverter in here. Right, that's what we want. Okay, that should actually allow us to get this process going. Let's see if we can wire this controller in now. Right, so we get our clock into the clock. And then that inverted latch signal goes into latch. Now let's take a look at the data coming in from that. Now in theory, we should be able to just take a look directly at the data and we should be actually pulling it in. Okay, so. Right, so we're seeing the kind of results we want. It's a little bit bouncy on that data line. I don't know how much of that is coming from the long wires on my scope probe. So I'm not going to worry about it right now. Okay, so I'm seeing two things to pay attention to here. Obviously, these are active low and we'd rather see active high outputs. And that yellow button seems to output two lines, which I don't like. The data in, we can start that off just by inverting it. Okay, that's nice. Okay, now the thing to note here is we're looking at the data that comes directly back from the controller. So either that's normal or we've got a misalignment between the clock and our latch. So the latch is appearing in the gap between clocks. Maybe it expects it to align. Let's try that. So we'll take the clock. Pass that into one of the inverters. That lines up now. Get the data back. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. We're seeing nice clean signals. And I'm seeing 12 unique ones. Okay, that was actually easier than I expected it to be. But of course, we're just looking at that on the scope screen. We actually need to build the circuitry to decode that now. Right, so before we used one of these 595 shift registers, only we're going to need to do two of those and connect them together somehow this time. Right, so we've got clear lines here. They're active low, so we pull them high to stop that happening. We've got a clock line for the shift register and a clock line for the latches for outputting it. Let's worry about those later, but we'll cross connect them. All right, I'm going to need an extra bit of breadboard to put some LEDs on. Now, we do have output enable lines here. They're active low, so I'm going to pull them down. And then we have the serial data line that we take from our inverter output. Okay, I think that's going to work for the first of these shift registers, but we need some outputs. All right, I position these LEDs so seven of the lines should come across fairly easily. Eighth one is kind of inconveniently all the way over there. Okay, well, we're not getting anything. Of course, we haven't connected the clock and the latch lines over. So we've got RCK and SRCK. So RCK is the output latches. So that needs to go to our inverted latch line. Well, it should be exactly the same as the one we're sending to the controller. And the other one is the clock, also exactly the same as we're sending to the controller. Still nothing. Okay, so the serial data's here. Output latch is fine. Input clock is fine. I think those LEDs aren't coming on just because I haven't got the ground line connected over. Uh, that was annoying. Okay, so shoulder buttons, A and X, they're our new buttons, are showing up on this shift register. And if we cascade the output from this shift register to this one, we should get the lower eight bits. So that's the serial input line 
and the top bit is duplicated there. Okay, so three of these aren't used. Awesome, that's that's all 12 buttons responding. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, and cut a few wires and neaten this up a little bit more, but I think this has turned out very nice. Okay, so we've got all 12 buttons responding out to LEDs here. And now we need to build a circuit that will get that back into the main CPU build so we can use the inputs in a game. That said, there's some complexities to that piece of circuit, so I think it's a good opportunity to take a break now and I'll do that in a second part. Okay, well that was quite painless. I'm really pleased with what we've got here. A circuit that can read all 12 buttons from the SNES controller in and present them as TTL signals that we can start working with in a future circuit. Interfacing that to the CPU build is gonna have a few complexities to it, so we'll save that for another video but I'm quite looking forward to getting that done. Hope you found this interesting. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you again soon. Goodbye.